Hello, Perf Bites listeners. Before we begin, please take a moment to listen to a word from our sponsors. Whether you want to load test your APIs or your browser-based applications, you need to be able to easily scale up volume and identify problem areas. SmartBear has you covered. LoadUI is the rock star of API load testing. Using an intuitive, versatile design, LoadUI gives you the power to scale up and out, letting you dial up high volume and real-world load from any number of local and remote computers, all within a single test environment. With LoadUI, it's easy to create and configure tests incorporating all of your OS, application, and database statistics agentlessly. It's fully interactive, too, so you can easily modify your tests and fix errors on the fly. Load Complete is an astonishingly easy-to-use load testing tool for HTML, AJAX, and rich internet applications. Create and run automated load tests in minutes using a browser to naturally record your interactions with your website or app. You can scale up the number of virtual users, pull in data from Excel and other data sources, monitor server resources during test execution, and even distribute your tests geographically. Reports and charts make it a breeze to explore aspects of how your site and app perform under pressure and ultimately pinpoint performance issues proactively. Load UI and Load Complete by SmartBear ensure outstanding performance across your entire web stack. It's time for Perf Bites. What the f*** is Perf Bites? The fourth square meal of the day. Simple like Perf Bites. Waffles. Microwave ready. Blah, blah, blah. Blah, blah, blah. Add nutritional value to your brain. It's time for Perf Bites with your hosts, Mark Tomlinson and James Pulley. Perf Bites. Whatever. Hey, it's time for Birth Bites with your hosts, your steadfastly curious hosts, Mark Tomlinson and my good friend, James Pulley. James, how are you? Fine. You're fine. That's it. That seems very basic. You just said it's very basic. It's no? Monday. It's Monday. It is a Monday, actually. We usually record on Sundays, but um, I've had a computer crash recently and rebuild, so we're on the brand new studio. It's very nice. So uh, welcome, everyone, to this episode of Perf Bites, where actually um, we're going to entertain a very important question in all of the some almost 50 episodes we've done. Um, we had an email sent in uh, to askperfbites.com. You can send us, people might not know this, we don't mention it, ask at perfbites.com is an email address. You can send James and I any question that you have about performance testing. Um, if you haven't had an answer or we haven't covered the topic, you can send us this. And recently we had somebody send one in uh, an email about batch performance testing. And sure enough, James, we have never specifically talked about batch performance testing. Well, Mark, I, I have to say every time I think of batch performance testing, yeah, I think about the you know that those background processes, a lot of noise. I'm thinking of Mel Brooks and Blazing Saddles. You know, batches. We don't need no stinking batches. You know, it's 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 just not us. You know that type of thing. But uh, but most corporations do have background or offline kind of back end process. In fact, most IT departments got their start at, at doing report runs in the middle of the night back in the early 60s, 70s, 80s. I mean, the whole idea of IT was was a batch job kind of run, right? It, absolutely. You know, it started on cards, then it went to tape, and now it's just just processes running overnight, you know. And, and like any other item related to performance, we have a requirement – we have a time, yep. we might have a throughput mark, and we might have some dependencies on resources that we can look to optimize. Yeah. So we'll get into all of that, um, which I think is a really great topic, and I'll actually cover the actual email we got. But first, James, there's uh, since we um, haven't really covered a lot of industry news over the last couple of times, so there's some cool stuff been happening going on that we've heard announcements on, right? Absolutely. And, you know, uh, just just so we can keep in the mood with kind of the news, news of the damn type of thing, all I can say is it's alive! It's alive. And what is alive? It is Storm Runner from Hewlett Packard. Storm or, Runner. Or, or proc.com, you know, one of, one of those two things or both of them. Yes, both um, of them. It, essentially, this is the, the webified version of the Load Runner controller. 
And it's interesting that people might tune into this podcast not knowing that I was the former HP Load Runner product manager. And back when we just took the good old controller that you know and love from Load Runner and we put it on an Amazon AMI in the cloud and we sort of ran a beta just to see how many companies, what we could learn, right? It was a research kind of, that's why you do a beta is just figure out, can you use it? What are the difficulties? Get the feedback. And of course, Shane and the guys now have had a couple of years, several years of feedback on what are they, what do people really want? Is, is it performance center hosted in the cloud or is it no. something different? No, they didn't want that. Did you just want load generators in the cloud? Nope. No, not. Nope. Don't want that. So to be honest, this is a whole, this people might think this is just another load version of load runner. It's totally different. The, the UI, this is a totally different brand new. Some of the engine pieces might be the same, but the experience you have is totally different, updated, and it, it, it's really it's nice. Cl- it's clearly targeted at this self-service model, uh, similar to what you have uh, with Sosta, with uh, Blaze Meter, and and a lot of the focus is really going after developers, not necessarily the traditional testers, but test on demand, yep. uh, low to high volumes, ramp up is needed. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very different model. It's, it's more in tune with um, that agile thing. Um, it is. It is. It may be, you could say it's targeted more towards a developer crowd. And I think of all of our work with Tim Koopmans from, uh, from Flood.io. Uh, and uh, again, working in the JMeter world, taking what were small developer unit type performance tests and making them larger and larger and larger. Um, Blaze Meter does a nice job of that as well. But as you point out, um, you know, this is this is territory that in in the early days of Load Runner, it was a separate team and it was usually in a waterfall type of methodology where you had a phase of performance testing and you would do that. Now we do all this continuous stuff, like working with Sosta and Cloud Test, it's continuous performance testing. You're doing it on every build, small, you know, it's a, there's a whole life cycle approach to having this. And some people, you know, they don't have all the resources to run everything in development or testing. So they have to move out to virtualized cloud-based load testing. And, we, and you know how I, I love virtualized generators. Yeah, go back and listen to that episode on virtualization yeah. and load. It was one of our biggest ones. Anyways, congratulations to the HP guys, Shane, Sylvia, and uh, John Jeremiah, right? Yep. Yeah, so and, you got it out the door, guys. Yeah, you got it out the door. Very good. And, and again, going along with changes in the industry and changes in focus, well, we've got a name change, Mark. Oh, no, really? Yeah. Did, did someone get married? You know, that's an excellent way to phrase the question. Um, <laughs> CompuWare. Oh, yeah. Decided after, after decades of being CompuWare, and at one time was the number two software company in the world. Oh, yeah. They're now changing their name to Dynatrace. Good, good news. I mean, that's a, that's a huge endorsement for the APM space around what Dynatrace does as a product. I mean, this is huge. Um, cause, and I, but I feel bad for the sort of maybe the redheaded stepchild called Gomez, which is in the mix there somewhere, right? It wasn't Gomez and Compuware, didn't they? Wasn't that the big coup a while back? Yeah, that uh, Gomez was the guppy that ate the, uh, the whale <laughs> of the uh, traditional Compuware QA tools. Yes. And, and I, I, I never quite understood that relationship. And the, uh, but, but here you've got Storm Runner, Loadstorm, Sosta, Flood IO, Blaze Meter, um, and uh, in the mix, Gomez was monitoring and load testing. You've got Keynote, which is still alive and well. They've got some new people working at Keynote that I know, which are great. There's, yep. the, the space is is changing. It's exciting. There's there's cool new stuff happening. So this is uh, this is good stuff. And, and Mark, there's a couple of items uh, from one of our sponsors, Smart Bear, as well. Awesome. It, if you noticed, uh, they, they made the 2014 Magic Quadrant for integrated software quality suites from Gartner. From Gartner, the Magic Quadrant. Yeah. And the the, the uh, mystical, the mystical triangle. What did the, we come the, up with? The, the, uh, or what was it, the mystical um, uh, column or something? Yeah. <laughs> 
I don't know. But it's pretty cool from a smart bear standpoint because a lot of times they get assessed as individual tools. Like a lot of things in the developer space, it's utilities and tools, uh, not quite sort of the full integrated like Visual Studio team system um, or the whole, you know, these things that are fully integrated, the Jazz platform from IBM. HP, of course, has the full end-to-end ALM type lifecycle. It's not an a- quite an ALM solution, but they're in the... Integrated software quality suite, which is nice. nice. And we'll have to call up Tom Murphy and, and congratulate him for including yet another. And Mark, I also have to mention this because, you know, my feelings are a little hurt here. Really? Is that uh, Smart Bear is going to be attending the Big Android Barbecue. Yeah. It, you know, BigAndroidBarbecue.com mm-hmm. in Hearst, Texas this, this coming October. Yeah. And what, what that is telling me as a Southerner is that I need to include Cal on our next 4th of July barbecue. <laughs> because if they're going to Hearst, Texas, that's that's kind of like that bovine zone oh, yes. on the barbecue and maybe a little ketchup as well. So if if I want our Smart Bear uh, buddies to join us, uh, maybe I got to include some cow. Or maybe this, maybe we just put this on our radar screen, right? Maybe, maybe the Perf Bites in your home, which has been wonderful so far, Maybe we we start teaming up. If somebody's having a tech conference with barbecue, it should be a performance haven for performance testing and engineering. So, you, you know, if, if we could get a couple of different um, uh, barbecue companies and scotch companies together to uh, to help sponsor the event, I, I think it would be fantastic. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna send those guys an email. But go check out the Smart Bear guys at a big Android barbecue dot com uh, website. They're going to be in the hearse. We we won't be there, but. Maybe we'll be there next year. You never know. But the Smart Bike guys will be there, so go and check them out. And um, we'll talk talk to Scott Barber, see if he's going. That should be pretty awesome. But um, there's a there's another tech conference with barbecue, so all performance people should just go there and, and do it. All right, James, that's kind of a briefing on the news, which is pretty awesome. But let's let's dig into this great topic, which, you know, we've had a few emails come out of the inbox from ask at perfbytes.com. But this one was really great. A very nice email um, from a guy made the name of Basant. And Basant sent us an email that said, first of all, thank you much for hosting the shows. It's very helpful for whom, whoever wants, or it should be whomever, Basant, by the way, whomever wants to learn, grow, and participate in performance testing and en- engineering arena. Um, I would like to request you guys have one session to discuss about batch performance testing as well as... Things like what what should we consider? What are the best practices for testing? What's the skill set? What's the challenges around batch performance? And this was a great question for ask at perfbytes.com because, like I said, we've done all of these shows and we've even done weird stuff like the cheese plate uh, episode from the 4th of July, which went way off. You know, and we've had the performance manifesto and we've talked about mobile performance. We've talked about virtualization and CPU and all this stuff. And we've never really done a show just on batch performance. So, James, this is our opportunity to respond to Basant for sending in a, a great what I think is a great question to really kind of take everything from all the other episodes and say, let's let's say you're a, a, a tester on the batch team. And James, maybe my question to you is. When you go work with a customer and there's a difference between working with like the front end e-commerce or front end performance testing or normal interactive dynamic performance. If you ever get pulled in directly to just say, look, this is batch performance. I I have, Mark. And and really, it breaks out into kind of four kind of broad categories Mm -hmm. involving these batches. The first category is what I like to call background noise. These are jobs that run live on the system during the day. And and as part of our test initial conditions, we need to have these things present. They're using resources. They're locking particular records. Um, Maybe we have to look at their performance as well, but certainly we need to have them in the system during our regular performance tests. Then then you come to these these scheduled jobs that move a lot of data. This is kind of the second class. Jobs that move a lot of data nightly before some sort of deadline. Let's say this is a warehouse management system, and then at 6 a.m., it spits out a giant report, which is a pick list that sends thousands of people scurrying in warehouses all over the planet. Right. Or, or I can think of uh, financial reporting. Like you have yeah. to do it before 8 p.m. every night. You have to take all of your orders or uh, 
you know, financing information or something and upload it to uh, to a vendor or to the Fed, something like that. Right. And and there are some companies that are practicing actually closing their books every night. So oh, literally yeah, they yeah. can generate a financial statement every morning. It's right. it's kind of kind of nutty, but you know, they do it. Yeah. Uh, this third category is what happens if they fail? <laughs> some of them are business critical, of course. Some of them can just be restarted, but you've got to, you, this implies that there is some definition of success and failure and how to avoid failure, particularly on the performance side. If something runs too long, which then has a cascade effect on other batches, right? we need to address that. Oh, yeah. And then finally, jobs that are vulnerable to exponential size or growth. And coming up on Q4, a lot of people spend what is left of their budget at the end of the year, or they're buying for holiday season, right? things of that nature. So you are likely to have changes in your batch size, particularly if it's related to revenue, yeah. during the fourth quarter, or if you're selling to the federal government space in Q3. So we're kind of coming off that and moving into Q4 for, uh, you know, consumer population. Right. So those are, just to recap, I mean, because you, you kind of fired through this pretty quickly. The four kind of areas that I agree you would look at, first thing first, right? If you have a background job, that look at that because that could disrupt a real paying customer or an employee uh, or any end user from using the system. So those should be at the top of the list. If you don't get to testing anything else, focus on those because that's going to, it's a background job or a batch job that will disrupt online dynamic transactions. The second one you mentioned, James, I think was this uh, things that move a tremendous amount of data. So um, if a data state is having like an ETL process, we'll talk about going from source system A to target system B if it's moving a tremendous amount of data to roll a cube, uh, that's a multi-dimensional database, or moving it to another location uh, over a network wire, those things are are really really important by some kind of deadline. So you have to get it done within a finite amount of time. Um, the third one I think you mentioned was things that are mission critical, right? If they fail, terrible. I mean, all hell is going to break loose, right? So you get fired, you'll lose business. Things are really into bad. And what was the fourth one? Fourth one are things that are sensitive to, like, let's say you double your business, your throughput for online orders in the holidays. Well, your batch size, well, maybe it takes an hour to run. Now it's going to take two hours <laughs> or it takes well, four hours well, to run. You, it's going to take eight hours to run. You know. Well, you hope the batch takes double the amount of time. Because there's always that hockey stick on resource utilization that at some point it goes from a linear growth to exponential growth. Right. So in, if, in response time. Yeah. So if the hockey stick is just at about one and a half throughput, a lot of businesses see about two to three times the volumes uh, during the holidays. It's Q4. And uh, if you're if you're if you're going to hit the max network throughput or you're going to hit the max amount of memory or CPU, that that exponential, that knee in the curve on a batch job could take you from something that usually runs 45 minutes. It could take 10 hours. I mean, if you're in an exponential curve, I've seen that, right, with, where the blocking just becomes terrible. Um, but um, that'll be good, James. So it, when was what was the last batch test uh, performance test that you had to do, James? Um. <laughs> Actually, actually, I'm in the midst of some right now. You are? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's phase two of some work that I'm working on. Um, so the first set is is we're doing the classical performance test. Then we're integrating the batch jobs. Uh, once we have the performance test in the can as a known good. Yep. So that way we're not dealing with A plus B equals 40 and, and trying to solve for one of the two variables. Right. And um, so, so that that's kind of an ongoing effort right now. Okay. So, so one one approach you're taking strategically is get the normal online performance testing done. Then you can sort of add in the added performance load of some background processing. Exactly, because okay. then I then I can accurately measure the impact of these two moving variables, independent of the other. I would say for folks who who are not necessary, if let's say they're on a batch team and they're a developer or a tester 
on the batch team and they really are disconnected from the online world, if our number one recommendation to you is figure out your impact on the online world, you have to make some new friends. So maybe start scheduling some meetings and talk about what kinds of jobs happen throughout the day. You might find somebody from the front end team or an app server team or the web team and maybe pull in the ops guys and say, you know, what's really happening? There's a 15 minute job that runs off, you know, all day long, a trickle feed or something like that. Let's really look at ops and say, do we do we have a real concern here? So one da- one danger I see is that sometimes the, the batch teams are very isolated because it's a different kind of programming and it's a different sometimes it's a different way of doing work. Um, but there are equal business critical kinds of functions. So you, it, you'll have to make some new friends and figure out, especially for these dynamic jobs that happen throughout the day, make, make some connections and see where they are on performance. You might even be ahead of them, you know? And, and, um, something that will help you in this case, if you have a monitoring tool that's looking at your response times every minute throughout the day. If you see little bubbles at the same time every day, little blips, or or you see little bubbles or blips periodically, once every 15 minutes, once every 30 minutes, once an hour, that's going to tell you that some of these background processes are contending for resources that your users may also be contending on. And something needs to be optimized, either the handshake from the client your end user and the, and that code or the handshake from the batch yep. or ideally both or, or both. <laughs> cool, James. So we'll come back and talk a little bit more about um, how to actually dig into this, but we'll take a little break uh, from our hosting sponsor, Nuco. Hosting for Perf Bytes has been provided by Nuco, new centers of excellence in performance engineering, script farm, load runner by the hour, cloud architect, by Daratech and LightSquare. For more information, visit the website www.newcoe.com or call 888-212-1104. Okay, great. So James, um, we were just kind of kind of digging into this sort of testing and looking and monitoring and stuff. And, and maybe we, we back up a little bit to review just the general topic of What's what is the most important thing to test or uh, or measure for performance for batch performance? In most cases, it is how long the batch takes to execute at its kind of maximum out of spec or maximum tolerance. So if I have my largest known batch and I'm running it and I have some expectation of how long it is going to take to complete. And that expectation is either based upon business critical need, I can take no longer than X, or it must be finished by X, or a a dependency that there are other smaller batches that run behind it. Maybe I have one set of transformation of data that another whole set of batches comes and consumes afterwards and sends to various portions of the system. So when you're looking at the batch, you're looking at time in particular, and the time that it takes is related to, once again, how it uses resources in the system. Right. So, uh, and we'll talk next about kind of the different phases of a batch job execution, the typical kinds of ones. But time, this is something I teach in the introduction to performance, which most people forget. They're like, show me how to use this tool or show me how to do these wizard guru things, Mark. And I'm like, let's just talk about time. And it's one of the biggest struggles actually for business owners, a product owner or a business analyst, or even your executives, your management, to really think about time actually being a business critical idea, right? So getting the information from a report from the overnight run so that business leaders can make decisions on what to do every day. That's actually a time sensitive. They want it every morning at 8 a.m. If you've ever been on the hook to for the marketing department or the, the secondary market or the trading floor or wherever you're working, if there's some report that they want in their inbox every morning, then and it doesn't show up, boy, if I've seen people in a panic, I've seen people lose their jobs just because that job didn't run. And so that's the time, as you point out, is just it has to be done by a certain specific every morning at a.m. 
or every evening at 5 p.m. The other part of time, as you point out, is just saying if we if we if these trickle jobs that happen every 15 minutes during the day. And let's say you have this job that's kicked off on a cron or something every 15 minutes. Let's say the job starts taking 10 minutes, 11 minutes, 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Suddenly that job that's scheduled every 15 minutes is taking 15 and a half minutes. You've got an overlap in your cycle so that basically the background job is backed up and it can never complete everything throughout the given day. And as we know, traffic throughout the day, you know, kind of slowly goes up and comes down and it ups, comes down, right? So that's the danger when we think about time. It's not the end user response time, but it's the number of records you can process within a given interval of either 15 minutes or hours or whatever it is. And, and the, the larger the margin that you have from your expectation of, of when it's going to take to complete, say a batch has to take eight hours overnight, if you can get that batch down to six hours or four hours or three hours or two hours or one hour, just think of what happens when it does, in fact, grow to an out-of-spec condition. You, you've now bought yourself a margin of error. Yeah. And actually, some people, you may find that your stakeholder, your business owner or product owner, are in like the analytics department, and they may run uh, massive multidimensional queries on specific sets of data to figure out something like trading in the market or futures for petroleum. This is the one I worked on um, where, you know, if you can actually shrink the query from, you know, four hours down to two hours, then they can make twice as many moves in the trades or the markets or the finance or whatever. It's kind of a very specific example um, but it's a good example to 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 illustrate what it could mean beneficially. It's a it's a very valuable thing to the company to get that information not twice a day, but four times a day or eight times a day. So if you can optimize a query to run faster and give you the same result, then the business, the people, the guys in the corner office, he or she that you know make big business decisions that are way above our pay grade, yeah. That's good. They may really enjoy that. The, and they may, it may be very beneficial and your company might succeed or your organization might be able to, you know, do good things. So, and, and, um, and Mark, let's not forget as a performance engineer, you can tie that directly back to your value to the organization. Yeah. So time is the most important thing. Um, but the next construct that you'll often hear in batch is this thing called ETL, uh, which stands traditionally for extract transfer and load and a lot of classic batch processing is extracting data so doing a query a select kind of query a select query from a data source moving that data to another location it could be a temporary file it could be over the wire to another system um, it could be even moving data from your systems to a partner so you could be uploading data to a third party uh, in another world an edi transaction um, and or you could be receiving data from a third party. Um, the transfer is moving that data back and forth. And of course, then the load is loading the data either into the target system or loading, you know, from from a third party, bringing it in. So extract, transfer and load. That was sort of the classic model for performance. And of course, the performance characteristics are totally different in each of those three phases. Extracting is about reading data, sometimes a lot of data from a huge query. And, and so, so this is a huge I.O. problem, typically. Yeah, typically you've got a bunch of data on disk and you have indexing. That's very important. Pull that data into memory. Maybe you're even doing a little bit of aggregation uh, before you transfer it. But selecting the data from the source system um, is, is very important. Transferring is typically going across the wire. James, most of the time it's it's a network connection of some kind. So going from, you know, one gig up to 10 gig was huge. Like you could move 10 times the data. Yeah. You know, just changing your type of network infrastructure for large frame sizes. Sure. Jumbo frames. Yeah. Minimizing the connection overhead or the infrastructure overhead in layer two and layer three so that you could move larger amounts of data with less I.O. 
commits uh, on each each of those is really really good. Um, and then loading is another I/O nightmare. And sometimes you have to load into memory in the target data system, and then that has to be committed and written to disk of some sort on the target system. So extract, transfer, and load, and then. Those are the three main areas. You've got a read performance from disk into memory or the database, network performance on transfer, and more disk I.O. writing disk I.O. on the target system. So extract, transfer, and load. Now, James, what do you think about this other word I throw in there? Instead of transfer, there's also transformation. I I agree, Mark, especially when most common transfers these days are going to an XML like model. There's, there's a CPU overhead in transforming the data that comes out of the system to the, this least common denominator model of XML uh, before it goes to another system, which then kind of decomposes the XML for import. Mm -hmm. And, and there is an overhead there. So when you look at this extract transfer, transformation and load, you have the complete resource model of finite resources Mm -hmm. listed right here. You have disk, CPU, network, and memory. Yeah. So when you're looking to optimize your batch performance, where do you think you're looking? And if you're in the extract phase, typically it's reading from disk, and then you can have the next step before you move the data, you could have a little transformation on the source system. So that could chew up CPU, could chew up memory because you're pulling those records into memory where you can maybe do a couple of averages or summing or, uh, you know, even the, like you say, XML transformation could be a type of compression as well that you're doing any kind of CPU overhead. Mm -hmm. So just the extract phase on the source system, it's it's definitely IO getting the data from, from it where it's resting into a dynamic state where you can massage it and transform it before you send it down the wire. Um, the network performance, all the classic stuff that we look at propagation, uh, just moving the data bandwidth utilization. Do I have a big enough pipe, uh, link speed and pipe and, and, and the routing capabilities, like you say, the frame size as well, just the, the health of that configuration, moving the data is there's usually when you're moving data from source a to source B, well, you're not really messing with it, right? It's encapsulated. It's in the payload and you're looking at maybe compression on either end in order to accelerate that. Um, but yeah, so, so transfer is not so much on the target system, James, I see a lot more people moving things into rolling a multidimensional database or they're, even if they're going into NoSQL, there's some transformation to split the data up and get it stored across the array correctly. And so there's some transformation that could just be organizational, or if you're rolling an OLAP cube, like a serious OLAP cube, there's a lot of of CPU processing required just to transform it into a cube, right? And usually the fact data gets stored and transferred, and then you roll a cube after you've committed it, right? True, true. And and something that, that you almost were there, but you didn't quite hit mark, yeah. is that as we go through this process, normally you, you think of it in a very stepwise fashion. I mm-hmm. grab, I transform. I commit, but you need to be thinking on a parallel basis if you want to reduce this window of operation where you have everything going on. Yeah. Because you want you want to grab the resources, hold them for the smallest amount of time possible, and then release them. If I can parallelize some of my operations, maybe move smaller file sizes um, across the network, which which allow opportunities for other items to come back through the network as well. Or I'm building smaller uh, extract files from multiple concurrent queries and then building them into a larger file for transfer. Yeah. Think about these opportunities for parallelism to improve the overall throughput. Yeah, and parallelism is kind of the next thing we'll talk about in terms of optimizing the whole batch window for sure. Um, but you, br- you bring up a good point, right? That the, you, we make it sound simple, extract, transfer, transform, load, but you may have 12 different jobs in 12 different stages all at the same time, which means IO gets randomized, uh, use of heap in the, di- in, 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 in an app or in a batch process or in a database source, a uh, target or source. 
Um, you're going to look at those things happening at the same time where you might actually benefit from allowing one job for a short period of time to dominate a source system or dominate a target system so that it can complete sooner. And we'll talk a little bit about those dependencies. That would be really good. Um, James, the other thing is um, uh, one of the things we, we all know extrapolation is evil. Maybe we should do a whole episode on extrapolation is evil. Uh, that, that that sounds like a good to- uh, good topic. Yeah. yeah, we could we could we can invite Satan to talk about true evil of extrapolation. I, I think he would enjoy that topic. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, one of the things if you're if you are a batch tester and you're in development and you're working with development data, a lot of times um, we want to give you a warning that if you estimate. Let's say in normal response times, you're testing at a 10% scale of production. You say, well, here we run on one machine and it takes, you know, a tenth of a second. So in production, if we run on 10 machines, it can take a second. And, you know, time and response time are not extrapolatable in that way. Um, Throughput, depending on the type of activity that's happening, could be extrapolated, right? If I can, if I can commit web service calls at you know, uh, 85% CPU on a 50% scale system, I should be able to scale to twice the volume, maybe depending on the job. With batch jobs, the thing that's interesting, particularly if you look at just transferring data between point A and point B, a source system and a target system, networking, because there's no additional stuff going on, as long as your network is configured the same as production, you can probably look at, all right, it took me... 10 minutes to move 100,000 records uh, uh, across the, between the two systems. Typically, that math works out pretty well if the network is you know, running at optimal maximum capacity because it's such a limiting, the pipe is very limiting, right? It doesn't really work the same when you're running like an eight-hour job that you would normally run in production. If you run it for five minutes and extrapolate, if there's a lot of transformation, if there's a lot of memory and their manipulation of the data during the extract and the load, that's not going to work, right? So, so, roll- so, so Mark, if, if we had to have a rule of thumb here, it would have to be the more resources that are involved in that particular stage, the less amenable it is to extrapolation. Yeah, exactly, right? I mean, if I'm trying to roll an OLAP cube on a machine that only has 512 meg of RAM, And in production, I have 16 gig of RAM or 32 gig of RAM on the database. Well, you know what? Memory is really fast. My estimations on rolling the cube in development have no comparison to what's going to run for IO and uh, memory in in production. So try to avoid extrapolation on those things that involve moving data, massaging data, transforming data. If you want to just do an estimate of, you know, reading n number of records, and the systems are somewhat similar or moving n number of records uh, between the two systems and the network is very similar resource, um, then, you, then your estimations can be pretty good. It, but it's a very, it's a good question that people have. They're like, well, look, I can't run the whole batch job because I don't have eight hours worth of data. I only have an hour's worth of data. And to be honest, an hour's worth of data is actually pretty good. Um, Uh, to do that extrapolation. But it's still something that in all performance testing, the minute you switch from actual testing of real systems and real data and real results into a mathematical model, you take risks. There are risks. The unknown is right there, right? The the knee and the curve could be right around the corner. Which is exactly why we referenced extrapolation as part of our performance manifesto. That's true. It is in. We're, we're going to return to the uh, performance manifesto, actually. Um, we prefer, generally, to, uh, to not have to do extrapolation, that we actually have real results. Uh, testing live in production. And um, the ghost of, not, it's not a ghost, I'll say. <laughs> I don't know why. Okay, okay, we'll call it the specter <laughs> of extrapolation. <laughs> the specter of extrapolation. Yes, exactly. Um, okay, James, in the next uh, part here, what if somebody is already on their way to doing batch testing and they're like, all right, I'm under the gun to make this batch job better or faster. How do we optimize? What are the approaches to optimizing batch jobs? Ah,
right? Contention between two batch jobs. If you're starting to, some people blindly run stuff in parallel and they're like, well, we can run job A because, and job B at the same time, because they either use different source data. A lot of times the ops guys are thinking, well, it's the source data, you know, the data for B and the data for A are totally different systems. And they forget that there's shared network. They might even run on the same, same server and they maybe have the same target system. So they, they start par- they start parallelizing things and then the contention actually happens on the target. But that's not the only place that, that you could have contention if you start running things in parallel, right? Right. I mean, read is usually, you can do that on a pretty dirty basis. Mm-hmm. Write or commits, generally you need a lock on the system. Right. And depending upon the amount of data coming in and how it's coming in, you might, on a classical relational database, you might have to lock a table. Yeah. <laughs> so, if, so if I lock a table for a bulk upload and I'm in batch job A and batch job B also has to do a bulk upload, which also involves the same table, somebody is going to wait. Yeah. So the first step is in optimizing batch performance is just to think about these parallel operations. And I usually do this in a spreadsheet where I list sort of each 30 minute window, 30 minutes usually works pretty well, sometimes more specifically, but th- every 30 minutes or from 8 p- p.m. to 8 a.m. I've got maybe a 12 hour window and I list in all of the rows, each of the batch jobs. And I put down, you know, what the dependencies are and then Put the window, how long does it typically take to run and what are the dependencies? And again, a lot of times the ops guys will just st- stack stuff up on, you know, they we take all this input and then we crunch a lot of stuff and then we, you know, create the output and the target system suffers. Um, if there's a dependency on the source where batch A actually creates a file or, you know, uploads a bunch of records and then batch job B is dependent upon that data. Sometimes you have a one to many relationship where one job runs and then 14 other jobs can take off right after it. And so if you haven't optimized the window to say, you know, when batch job A runs, and I can think a bit about some of these orchestration systems, James, it thinks about Autosys. Uh, My current uh, customer uses Control M. Um, Informatica is another one. And these are like sort of batch orchestration and they help you figure out how to get these processes on the schedule, dependencies, inputs, outputs, et cetera. Um, So it can make it very easy, but it doesn't replace your analysis of each of those 30 minute windows. Which job is doing what? Are they reading? Are they writing? Are they locking? Are they moving data across the wire? Are they using up memory? Are they using up CPU? In each of those 30 minute intervals, ask those questions. Does this job need a lot of CPU? Does it need a lot of network? Does it need a lot of disk? What, what is it doing on each of those resources? And, and Mark, all it takes is one rogue batch file in, in those orchestration schemes. Something that a, a developer is running on a test system, an ops guy or gal is running on one of the production boxes. Yep. It's outside of the schema that has a similar dependency. Yeah. And all haywire shows up. Yeah. But let's talk... More specifically, because the number one bottleneck I see people hitting is is I.O. Still, especially in the virtualized world, you know, people, for some reason, it's like working at Microsoft again, where, you know, even the best database people, I say, well, there's a D drive. I don't know what's underneath the D drive. They didn't know if it was a mount point or a, a local spindle or a SAN or whatever. They had no idea. So optimizing for I.O. is probably the number one thing from a reading or writing capability. So um, if you if you're having to optimize for IO, think about the different tools you have at your disposal. Every operating system has an IO stat or a disk monitor of some kind. Um, and looking at how many jobs are running in parallel in that same 30 minute window. So if you have job A and it's doing a lot of reading and job B that's doing a lot of writing, if they're on the same entity, or on the same spindles, you don't want to have them in the same 30-minute window. You're actually a little bit better off having a 
a 30 minute window of three jobs that are doing reading and the controllers and everything in the storage subsystem can get optimized for reading. And then another 30 minute window that does a bunch of writing. And so you can actually kind of like any good database uh, performance, the like the mantra separating your read, reading from your writing activity can help tremendously um, because you're not, you know, putting heads back and forth in totally different states. And the microprocessors on the controllers can actually start to favor a read cache or a write cache kind of uh, I.O. pattern. Um, and you'd be surprised, um, you know, it sounds sort of esoteric or, or kind of a vague reference, but it can make a 20 percent. I've seen maybe 30 percent difference depending on the job. That's really hitting uh, the I.O. subsystem that much. And, and, and Mark, as a compliment to the, the disk I.O., the network I.O., if oh, it, yeah. even if we were to just compress a file before we ship it across a network link. Or if we have two machines that are right next to each other, but they're having to go through a very, very busy networking environment to get from one point A to point B, how yeah. about we consider a crossover cable as a dedicated route? I oh. just, I love, so many network guys just cringe at the idea that there's a crossover, you know, that we saw in, in the virtualized world. People are like, oh, I would never do that. Um, but I, I've seen guys that run major VMware virtualization stacks in their entire system. They're still better off with a crossover cable on a server connected to itself just to use, uh, it, even if they have to cross security barriers. Sometimes the systems are secured and hardened separately, but they're opened up just to move data between these two things. Yep, a Crossover cable is a, is kind of a secret weapon, actually. Um, no noise, no retries, full bandwidth, just dedicated to your work. I mean, I mean, I mean imagine yeah. a, a high performance uh, networking solution that's 10 gigabits or faster with large frame sizes and you have to pump a lot of data and yeah. you don't have to fight with anyone else on that wire. Even even with a category one glass cable, you can have that the, that crossover three kilometers from point A to point B. Yes. Easily. Now, for those of you that are in the cloud and the virtualized world, the virtualized data center or the cloud, you may not have these choices, but you could choose other kinds of IPC mechanisms. I mean, in VMware, you can have these loopback addresses. In the cloud, well, sometimes you'll see that the cloud vendor themselves will try to optimize if you have two systems, two VMs that are talking next to each other. You might switch to a dedicated virtual machine, a de dedicated VM in the cloud. And sometimes those dedicated clouds, if you really pay the premium with the cloud vendors, they can actually put those two machines physically next to each other. I mean, it starts being, you know, where you go from generic hosting in the cloud to being very specific hosting providers. But, you know, that's part of the evolution. Anyone that's superly serious, if your whole business depends on shaving off another half an hour or an hour on a batch job and a crossover cable will do it there you may have to change your hosting model in the cloud in order to take advantage of that the, it, just because of IO yeah something that i've seen that impacting batches in the cloud uh, really over the last 18 months are, are are with these large geographically dispersed cloud providers you can think microsoft yeah. amazon rackspace where as a company i have portions of my infrastructure in location a other portions in location b and they're running batches which are pumping data across internet backbones, not dedicated backbones from right. data center A to data center B. And it, it takes a while. Consider for these batches, which have a high network IO dependency, have the, the source and the target inside the same data center, even if you have to roll up multiple backend targets. Yeah. It, 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 and it, it may be cheaper to do the work uh, to do the full ETL at the source and then transfer the final file across the wire offline in, in some kind of way. That, that's a good point. Um, the last thing I want to drive home, a lot of batch performance testing folks are really, 90% of their job is really working in a database. They're, they're querying data from the source, they're transforming, they're doing OLAP cubes, et cetera. And I really want to uh, make a couple points about configuring your database for optimal performance in batch. And it comes down to partitioning. We hear a lot, especially in batch jobs, when you're doing reporting, quarterly, annual kinds of look back periods where we do date-based partitioning. 
uh, or partitioning of any scheme whatsoever. Now, there's an optimization that works well for selecting data where you add basically a partition ID, a logical ID on a partition that allows you to only query a subset of that particular entity, right? So you're looking at only March or February or January as you look back. Or, or, or you can partition your indexes based upon date range or last name or something of that nature. So instead of going A to Z or January to March, you just start right at March. Yeah, and and part of the part of the benefit when you look at sort of the cache manager or buff man, buffer manager within the database is that it can load the entire a single partition. It can load the entire index into memory, or it can load the entire entity into memory if you have enough memory. And it doesn't have to load the entire table, the entire structure of that table. It just loads logically that partition, which is a great benefit. Um, when it comes to sort of the logical capabilities or the schema for partitioning data. The thing that you shouldn't forget is that your physical partitioning, the actual physical data files, if you really want to get the maximum benefit out of logical partitioning, match up the physical partitioning. Have each partition logically for a given month, per se, uh, matched up to a specific data file for that month. And you might even query if you're going to do an annual look back or a query that goes back over multiple years, you have individual data files on individual and you basically create a multi-lane freeway. And it's, let's say you really need a, a super look back period in a select or even commits to optimize the database IO. Don't just think about logically partitioning. You might also benefit from actually uh, physically partitioning that data. Um, James, the other uh, tip you may know more about is on constraints and indexes. And, and usually when you're bulk uploading data, you're going to have to maintain some sort of large lock. Um, having these partitions broken up also limits the scale of the lock that's going in the system, uh, yeah. depending upon how your indexes are organized. Uh, sometimes you can even do locking to the cell level on various uh, systems. So if you can minimize your both your lock size and your lock window, then mm -hmm. you have a lessened impact on other users of the system that are attempting either to read or to write. Because as soon as you start contending, then somebody has to wait. Because yeah. the lock the lock token only goes to some one per, one party at a time. And you might also consider that uh, if the schema itself for an entity has uh, certain constraints or certain indexes, typically when we're running a batch job, sometimes we don't need all the edits. We don't need all of the filters for online transactions. We sort of maybe we're taking a snapshot of just that point in time for the data. You might actually drop the constraints or, or even the indexes on the target system while you're putting the fact data, the actual data into the system. Oracle can do this automatically for you uh, in some of their ETL management, Autosys and Informatica and Control-M. Control-M not so much, but Autosys I think does some of the, Informatica does some of this for you. Um, but it's, so some of those logical constraints and, and maybe, and I commit the data, I have to automatically update the index. Well, you might postpone updating the index until the data would actually be used uh, when you're rolling the cube. So think about, you know, separating the constraints or dropping the constraints and indexes on your commits. Um, and the last thing I have to say, generally, if you're working with analytics, if you're doing if you're rolling a new cube, just throw as much as much memory as you can at, at that, because it is a CPU and memory. If you have healthy I.O. and you don't have enough memory uh, to actually do that, crank it up. More memory makes cubes happy as far as I know. And, and um, um, Perfbytes endorses the use of InfiniBand network technology for your interconnects. <laughs> Do we? We're not paid to endorse that. We're, we're not paid we? to endorse it, but we just think it's really cool. We like, InfiniBand is very cool. Um, yeah, exactly. Uh, but I'm really digging this new Samsung Wi-Fi that goes like, you know, 10 times faster. It's really, that's pretty awesome. I need that. That, 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 that? Yeah, oh yeah, that, that was like a giant tease when it showed up on Facebook today. Yeah, I know that was, that was fantastic. All right. So this was, this was good. We covered batch. So thank you to Basant uh, for sending in the email to ask at perfbytes.com. 
about batch performance. I think James, we we kind of covered a, a good good amount of information about how to get started. You know, look at those batch jobs that interfere with the with the current online transactions during the day, plus mission critical batch jobs. How to optimize them, right? And uh, how to get approach how to approach ETL optimization is a critical part of uh, of uh, batch pro- batch performance. So. Thank you once again, Perfice listeners, for joining James and I for yet another riveting, um, extracted, transferred, and loaded episode of Perf Bites. And of course, we always thank you for joining us uh, for the time you spent listening to the show today. As always, I'd like to thank my mother for tuning in. Yes. Thank you to James' mom. And thank you, of course, to the sexy Irish voice of Perf Bites, who does the intro voiceovers for... Um, we're making sure that uh, we're comfortable. She's resting comfortably. She's got a head cold, and as it would be, flu season is coming. She doesn't have Ebola, as far as I know. Oh, that, that, that's, that's good. That's a good thing. That's good. And, of course, special thanks to our great sponsors, Smart Bear and HP, or Pronk, I will say, for their sp- continued sponsorship and support of the Perf Bites show and the Perf Bites community. Comrades, today's show is powered by a five-year plan for total system takeover. We shall be victorious over the Martian capitalist dogs. Martians are capitalists? Yes, they are. Very good. And of course, please remember that all the contents of this Perf Bites episode is copyrighted and protected by a convection oven, which may heat you up evenly to 450 degrees for 45 minutes until brown, and then will serve you up to the newcomers at Terminus on The Walking Dead. For more information about Perf Bites, please visit the show's website, www.perfbites.com, or follow us on the Twitter and the Facebook. And of course, you can always tune in and subscribe to the Perf Bites podcast on iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and, and probably dozens of other locations. Just open your favorite listening app and search for Perf Bites, click subscribe or favorites button or whatever you have. The Perf Bytes show and staff are supporters of the Practical Performance Analyst, the Performance Engineering Book of Knowledge, the Computer Measurement Group, the Workshop on Performance and Reliability, and of course, the Software Test Professionals Community of Software Testers. And we hope to see you at the next SDPCon conference. We'll be doing a live Perf Bytes show, uh, and um, we're, we'll, I'll be presenting a bunch of stuff. We'll be hosting some other things. It's going to be really awesome. So check more out at www.sdpcon.com. Check it out. James, thanks very much for uh, for uh, joining me for another episode, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully everyone will hear us next week. Y'all come, y'all come back now. You hear? <laughs>